welcome to the uh, East Brunswick Historical Society's program on the history of East Brunswick. We're going to try to do in an hour, an hour and a half, many centuries of history. So obviously, we're not going to be able to hit on every subject. Our speakers will be introduced in a moment, but I'd like, I'd like to acknowledge a dynamic, and I'm going to call her a young lady, who has contributed so much in many ways to East Brunswick, our president emeritus, Estelle Goldsmith. We should all have our energy when we get to her age. Um, after the presentations, please uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, unless you have a really important question during the presentation, please try to hold it. Uh, also, take time later to take a look at some of the exhibits here. On the right, for example, we have pictures of all of our mayors, uh, including up to the present. And uh, also, we'll have refreshments in the back. So, um, so let me uh, at this point introduce our program chairman, uh, Howard Schmidt. Howard. We've got a really uh, outstanding program today. It's a program that we've been working on actually for a long time. Um, we felt that, you know, you're living in a community like this, it's important for people to know where this town came from, how it was, um, who settled here, how the town developed, uh, who lived here, and how it got to the point that it is today. That's the first uh, two-thirds of the program. Uh, we're going to have Manny Alvarez, who's our president, will do the first, the early history of uh, East Brunswick, up to 1860, which is when the town was incorporated as an official municipality. And then Mark Nunstein, who's a, a prominent historian here from Middlesex County, will be doing the period from 1860 up to the present. And uh, our last speaker will be our own mayor, uh, Brad Cohn, who will be talking about the future of this town and where it's going. You know, we all can see that the town is in transition. So I'm sure you're going to want to hear what, what the mayor will have to say. Uh, about the future of the town. Uh, a, a couple of other announcements that I wanted to point out to you. I want to thank a few people who did a lot of work on this. I want to thank uh, Manny and Ann Alvarez, longtime members who did an, uh, put a lot of work in terms of the uh, materials that are here, the PowerPoint program. I want to thank uh, Mark Nonstein, who's going to be our second speaker, and also uh, the mayor for taking the time to come and, and help us with the program. I want to thank Rosalie Littlefield, who is our art uh, director, who put together all of the artwork that you see in the back. She organized and uh, put the, the, the beautiful flyer together. I want to thank also Kathy Sullivan, who's our chairman of the uh, publicity who helps publicize the program to the newspapers, the media, EBTV, and so forth. Kathy's been with the society a long time. And last but not least, I want to thank Jeff Lipp. Jeff's with the East Brunswick Recreation Department. He has been really very unselfish in helping uh, our society and other organizations set the room up. Uh, he helped put the flyers together. Uh, help publicize it on his uh, email list, and Jeff's done a tremendous job for us. We're very appreciative of, of his efforts. Because when you put a program together like this, uh, it, it, it takes a lot of hands, okay? All right, without any further ado, let me introduce the, our first speaker, Manny Alvarez, who's also the president of our society, and he's gonna do part one of the show. start with a brief overview of the people and circumstances that played a role in how and when East Brunswick came to be. And we're going to be discussing the period before 1860. <coughs> Thousands of years uh, before the arrival of the Europeans, there were indigenous people who had migrated here from the western side of the continent. 
these people went by many names, including the Lenape or Lenape, and were later called the Delaware Indians. When the Europeans arrived, there were perhaps as many as 20,000 indigenous people in all of what we uh, now call New Jersey. When uh, Spain sent explorers sailing west under Portuguese navigator Columbus near the end of the 1500s, the purpose was to find commercial trade routes to the Indies and the Orient. When, uh, when they set sail west, owing to uh, trade winds, currents, and other navigational uh, techniques of the time, uh, the explorers made landfall far south of this area in what we now call the Caribbean. Uh, the Spanish and Portuguese played essentially no role in this area. Between the, but when the explorers returned to Europe with tales of discovery, some commercial interest was generated in other seafaring nations. Uh, they became especially interested when uh, Magellan proved that the Indies could be reached by sailing west from Europe. Some of the uh, seafaring nations that played a role in this area shown on this map. Uh, we have, for example, we have France, we have England, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Uh, Holland was a very important one. Small country, and perhaps we don't see it as a big country today, but in those days, it was a very important trading company. Uh, so the European uh, countries sent out their own explorers to find new world opportunities, uh, and they were particularly still looking for a northwest passage around the north of the continent, heading for the Orient. Uh, the goal throughout this period of time was trade. It was not colonization, and that was what their focus was. But interest in, interest in establishing trade colonies was uh, sparked after English navigator Henry Hudson sailing for Holland reported on the abundant resources that he found when he sailed in this area here. Uh, and also the opportunity to trade for expensive furs with Indians. Uh, and another important thing is the climate here was not unlike that of Holland. So uh, they began to uh, uh, establish settlements. But in England, King James of England, uh, he had a different objective. He was more interested in forming colonies. So in 1664, the English seized the Dutch colonies, uh, set up a pr proprietary colony, and they, uh, part of it they called New Jersey. To encourage colonization, uh, the king uh, granted many concessions, uh, including freedom of religion and uh, the ability to own land, things that were not that available to ordinary people in England at the time. So uh, when New Jersey became an English colony, uh, it wasn't entirely English, only about half. Uh, there were people here at that time from Holland, uh, Belgium, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Scotland, Sweden, and Wales. So it was a, a mixture of European people. Later in 1776, after New Jersey declared itself independent of Britain, our, our area, believe it or not, played a small part in the Revolutionary War. This is uh, Venice Island, sometimes called Clancy's Island. It's located over by the, uh, where the uh, towers are, that area, the dump, turnpike, <laughs> by the Red River. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not there anymore, but during the Revolutionary War, the British had placed troops on a high point uh, on the island, so they could uh, they could overlook the Rat River and warn of any patriots coming up the river toward New Brunswick, where there were a lot of British troops stationed. Uh, but on a very cold February evening, February 18th, just a few days ago, was the anniversary in 1777, Colonel John Nelson marched his troops from Cranberry to the island and attacked the British outposts. Several soldiers were killed, and many British troops were captured. Although this incident was more of a skirmish than a battle, uh, it at least was a morale booster, because at that time, things were not going very well for the Patriots. And in fact, it even drew the attention of General George Washington when he made note of it in his communication. So it played a little role. I would say that relatively few communities in the modern United States can claim any role in the war for independence. 
East Brunswick certainly can. Earlier, uh, while still under British rule, the New Jersey colonial legislature established four counties, including Middlesex in, 18, in 1675. At that time, Middlesex County actually ran from the Delaware River to the Atlantic Ocean, so it was a very big county. Uh, when the, uh, the legislature also divided the counties into townships, which were settlements in a large, mainly rural geographic area, and it did not include, the townships did not include established cities such as New Brunswick and Perth Amboy. Uh, a, a township was uh, something that came from England. It was a, a type of administration. We had all these settlements and all these communities, but there was not necessarily any administration. But by forming a township, now you had a, a governing body that could uh, uh, pass laws, etc. In Middlesex County, two of the eight new townships were North Brunswick and South Brunswick. Uh, you see them on the left there, and they took up most of the western side of the state. Now, North Brunswick was so called because it was north, not because it was north of New Brunswick. Because, in fact, it was actually south of New Brunswick, but it was north of South Brunswick. So that's what they called it, North Brunswick. Uh, the township of North uh, Brunswick included elements, uh, settlements that later became part of what we now call East Brunswick. The new counties and townships were formed in, in, uh, later because they, they continued to split up in the new townships. And one of them that was formed in 1838 was Monroe Township. Uh, I mention that because Monroe, as well as North Brunswick, played a role in starting uh, East Brunswick. Now, early settlements at that time generally were uh, located near navigable waterways, such as what we now call the Red <coughs> River and the South River. Waterways were important for commercial uh, uh, purposes and, and, and provided a way to transport goods to large markets, such as New York and Philadelphia. Around the late 1600s, two settlements uh, started in this area. Uh, what you see there now in pink is basically East Brunswick today. Uh, but the top circle is uh, in the northern part is um, where in 1677 a, a fellow named Thomas Lawrence from New York purchased thousands of acres from local indigenous people. The area was called Lawrence Brook and the waterway later became uh, called Lawrence Brook as well. In the southern part of this area, uh, by the South River, where the settlement started in 1685, called South River Bridge, owing to a small bridge at the location we now call this area the Old Bridge Historic District. Uh, growth of industry in the 17-1800s was facilitated by an abundance of raw materials, particularly immense quantities of wood and the sand and clay suited for making bricks and pottery. In addition, the area proved, provided uh, fruits and vegetables from the good land. All these things could be transported inexpensively by boats to markets. In abundance, the abundance of a variety of wood led to the start of some shipbuilding in the Old Bridge area. Uh, much of the brick used to build New York uh, went through South River, through the Old Bridge area, through South River, <coughs> to the Raritan River, and th through the Raritan Bay to New York. Other industries in the Old Bridge area were snuff, sawmills, liquor, clothing. Uh, later, at, at, at that time, the later construction of roads and railroad line also provided access to markets inland now. Uh, it was a great place for business at that time. And some uh, names that we still recognize today from that era <coughs> were names like Visit, DeVoe, Rue, DeHart, uh, just to name a few. Now, why East Brunswick was formed can only be guessed at, because the uh, reasons and all the information and petitions that were used are missing from the historical record. But what is known is that there were endless uh, squabbles in the 1800s between the eastern part of North Brunswick Township and the western part. Now, the eastern part is where most of the people live, but we can glean some, some uh, uh, ideas from the events of the time, and there were a number of factors involved. 
One was uh, economic. Uh, there was a depression in 1857 that impacted on the, all of the uh, township's ability to administer. Uh, and uh, it became a real issue throughout the area. Uh, both Monroe and, and uh, North Brunswick Townships were really having a tough time during this period. And there was a lot of discontent among the people. There was a difficulty for North Brunswick and Monroe Townships to maintain roads, bridges, and schools, etc. cetera. And, and Monroe especially uh, had very poor and limited roads, uh, which hampered uh, the uh, uh, commerce in the area. In fact, road issues were so rampant in, in Monroe that they often referred to them as the road wars. Um, another issue uh, was that the commercial region and farming regions, uh, the difference between the commercial and the farming regions. In eastern villages of Washington, now South River, and Old Bridge on the, on the South River, uh, these were commercially oriented and shared little in common with the rest of the, uh, the main, <coughs> mainly rural agrarian region in the western part of North Brunswick Township. Uh, does this surprise the mayor? <laughs> what else is new, right? At this time, uh, the town, we had to perform a government then, they had town meetings, and the public had more direct impact and say on taxes, and the taxpayers within the two uh, commercially oriented villages, Old Bridge and Washington, South River. Uh, on the South River, wanted a smaller, more manageable township. Around 1859, some tracts of land in Monroe, this was uh, more isolated areas, uh, were basically is isolated from everyone else. And they, they had no, no taxable uh, enterprises, uh, and they were willing to give up land without any squabble and one of the things that they were quite happy to get rid of was uh, what we now call the Jamesburg Park area. Another thing at the time were some political issues. The uh, people in the northern part of Monroe were uh, motivated by uh, proposals that a new township might provide them with their own election district and polling place. The politics were involved there. And uh, another factor then was going to a poll to vote in those days was a much more difficult thing than it is now. Uh, moreover, around 1859, there was much unrest in the nation, and as a conflict was looming between the North and the South, and change was in the wind. The struggle for the formation of East Brunswick Township took place in late 19, 1859 and early 1860 within the State House of Trenton, in Trenton. The first mention of a new township occurred on February 16th when a petition was presented to the New Jersey General Assembly by the representative from Middlesex County, Garrett Schnedeker, who later became a mayor of East Brunswick. The future township name, East Brunswick, was not mentioned. On February 18, Assemblyman Schnedeker proposed an act for the formation of a new township embracing parts of North Brunswick and Monroe Townships to be called the Township of Washington. But on February 22nd, 1959, 69, 1859, <laughs> uh, the township name of East Project was used for the first time in the New Jersey Assembly in reflecting that the new township would be created on the east side of the Lawrence Brook. Schnedeker left office before action was taken. Other people carried the ball. And on February, February 28, 19, 1860, the Township of East Brunswick was incorporated. This map shows the lands granted to farm East Brunswick in the shaded area. On the left, you see how much of North Brunswick was lost to become East Brunswick, and on the bottom, uh, you see the Monroe area that became part of East Brunswick. Only a small part of Monroe came to East Brunswick, but a lot of North Brunswick did. Now the irregular shape of East Brunswick is owing to the, the uh, borders that were waterways. We have the Raritan on the north, the South River on the east, the Lawrence Brook on the north, uh, northwest, Ireland Brook southwest, and the Manalapan Brook down. The only part is the, uh, that's directly connected to land 
is the, the part jutting down at the bottom uh, by uh, Monroe. So um, what we have now here is East Brunswick in 1860, the way it looked in 1860. And you can see it includes parts of uh, areas that eventually left East Brunswick. You have Helmetta that left, you have Spotswood area, South River area, Milltown area, and that ended up with the, the present border of uh, our town. Um, now, we'll hear about East Brunswick from 1860 to the present, and uh, we'll call upon uh, Mark. Thanks, Mitty. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, introduce our second speaker, Mark Nunstein. Many of you know him. He's a prominent local historian. He has been associated with the museum for many years. And he is now the division head of the Middlesex County Office on Arts and History. So in other words, he is the Middlesex County historian. And um, he's also written several books on the history of this particular area and Middlesex County. And Mark is going to cover the period from 1860, from the time we became a township, to the present date. So without further ado, let me introduce Mark Nunstein as our second speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I uh, also want to thank all of you for uh, coming out and uh, being a part of this uh, program this afternoon. There's a lot of great history in this township, and um, uh, we're gonna dive right into it. So as Mandy mentioned, East Brunswick Township was formed on February uh, 28, 1860. And any time that you have a community that has some age to it, um, and clearly, you know, as Mandy mentioned, um, there's a history that uh, goes back farther than that. It gives us an opportunity to reflect on that past as we try to understand our history, where we came from, how we got to this point, and ultimately where we're going. So I hope in some respect the two of us will uh, tell about the history, how we've gotten to this point, and then uh, Mayor Brad Cohen will help chart us on the direction that we're all uh, headed in. Um, and I do want to thank the East Brunswick Historical Society for helping to uh, coordinate the event today, uh, the East Brunswick Museum for um, uh, the display and the work that they do, uh, Mayor Brad Cohen and the Township of East Brunswick for also helping to uh, promote and coordinate the event uh, as well. This is a photograph of Helen Stanovich, and this was taken along uh, Ruse Lane in the 1940s. Um, in the vast uh, farm fields along Bruce Lane near what is today Mercer Road in Waverly. Uh, and East Brunswick during this time was certainly much different. And again, we can see Helen uh, standing there or sitting there uh, among the, uh, the farm fields that once lined uh, Ruse Lane. And I always love this image because of its artistic quality uh, to it. And it reminds me very much of another uh, image, a famous painting by Andrew Wyeth, titled Christina's World, where Wyeth painted his neighbor, uh, Christina Olson, in Maine. And I often thought, had he lived in East Brunswick in the 1940s, he could have been equally inspired by the landscape that he was inspired uh, when he was up in Maine. And certainly the 1940s are really not all that long ago, but yet it's photographs like Helen Sinovich in those farm fields which show a real world of difference uh, from what was just really 70 years ago. Um, and yet, as Manny pointed out too, we have a history that goes back much older than that. And I'll build on some of the points that Manny talked about uh, with the Native people and this early history uh, that was here. So this is a photograph taken in 1939 of archaeologists working in East Brunswick. I'll reveal the location in a moment. Um, but really the earliest history of East Brunswick belongs to the native people that lived here. And much of what we know about them comes from the archaeological record. It's archaeologists who have been digging actually throughout New Jersey that have given us the history of many of the early uh, inhabitants that were here. Uh, people that have been here in some cases as much as 10,000 years ago. So this is a very rich history of groups of people that lived here for many centuries. And 
Um, these are archaeologists working on, as uh, Mandy pointed out, Clancy's Island or Bennett's Island, which would later become uh, Edgeboro Landfill um, in 1939, looking for evidence of a Lenape campground that was once there. And in fact, they did find the evidence of uh, artifacts, mainly stone implements that belonged to these early native people. And uh, those artifacts today are in the uh, New Jersey State Museum. And this is just another uh, image of those archeologists working out, um, again, where uh, Edgeboro Landfill would eventually come in the 1950s. Um, the lady that's standing in the trench, that's Dorothy Cross. She was the New Jersey State Archeologist from the 1930s. She retired in uh, the 1970s. And uh, Dorothy was responsible for much of the early uh, history in understanding um, archaeology and the native people that lived here. Uh, she uh, initiated a survey during the 1930s to catalog sites not just in East Brunswick, but throughout Middlesex County and the state of New Jersey. So a lot of what we know about the early archaeological record from these native people comes from the work that uh, Dorothy Cross uh, did. Uh, she was really a pioneer uh, in the archaeology field, as was her um, uh, Lorraine Williams, who replaced her, who was the state archaeologist from uh, the 1970s until uh, her retirement. Currently, uh, Gregor Latanzi is the uh, New Jersey state archaeologist uh, today. So just to put uh, an image behind those native people that were here, these are some early, uh, one is a painting and a woodcut of a Lenape uh, chieftain, um, the one gentleman with the blue uh, blanket and he has a tobacco pouch with a, a tobacco pipe uh, was painted around 1735. Uh, Tishkahan was his name. He was a Lenape chieftain. And uh, next to him is his uh, nephew, Teddy Uscom, who was uh, born near uh, Trenton around the year 1700. Um, but it also shows you some of the tensions that were happening among the native people that lived here. Right, this was a time period where there was an influx of European uh, colonists and settlers that were coming into the region, pushing many of them out of what would be East Brunswick, out of Middlesex County, out of New Jersey, pushing them into the west, the westward migration. Um, these tensions between those native people that were keeping their traditional apparel and their ways of life, and those that were uh, adapting to colonial dress and customs as well. So here you have two people of the same family, right? but really on polar opposites of how they viewed their interactions with, um, with the early colonists. Uh, Teddy Uscombe was um, responsible uh, and part of the, um, the Treaty of Easton in 1758, which basically sold off most of the, uh, the land in New Jersey. Uh, he died in a house fire in 1763. Uh, they were sort of pushed out of central New Jersey. They ended up relocating to northeast Pennsylvania up by Scranton. Um, and in 1763, folks that were not, uh, had conflict with him burnt his house down and he was killed in the, uh, in the fire uh, in 1763. But, you know, there, again, there was much tension with um, the, the native people that were here uh, in the, um, the early 18th century as this area was flooded by uh, colonists that were um, uh, populating the area. But we still have reminders of them and we still find these artifacts and these, uh, these items today. This is a large ax head that was found off of um, Old Bridge Turnpike about 30 years ago. Um, and many of these artifacts have been plowed up as farmers used to plow their fields here in East Brunswick. They would kick up all kinds of reminders of the native people that once lived here. And um, pottery uh, as well. In fact, the East Brunswick Museum has a pretty substantial collection of Native American pottery, some of which goes back thousands of years. So, you know, we're talking about a culture, a civilization that's older in some respects than the Egyptian pyramids. Right? Folks that were here as much as 10,000 years ago. And it's important to, uh, to recognize that. This is one of the earliest maps of central New Jersey and the area that would become East Brunswick. It's from 1683. Uh, historians call this the Reed map. That was the um, last name of the gentleman that uh, surveyed and put this map together. He was uh, part of the East Jersey proprietors that were um, uh, inhabiting and dividing up the, uh, the land in this area for settlement. Uh, Manny talked about Thomas Lawrence. If you look uh, right there, you can see uh, it says the, the abbreviation of Lawrence and then Baker. He was an English baker uh, that settled in what would become the Lawrence Brook section of East Brunswick. 
So you have the Raritan River here, where it branches off on the South River. Uh, the Fullerton track here would be where the Old Bridge Historic District is today. And then the lands running off of the South River would be the area where East Brunswick would ultimately be formed. Well, you know, in this case over, let's see, this is 1683, so about 150 years later. But you can see what attracted the early colonists, the early settlers, right? It was the accessibility to waterways. Look at where all these early large tracts of land were set up. They're set up along the Raritan River. And if you follow it up, you can see a little hand towards the top that notes John Indian's land that would later become where New Brunswick is today. But what was, what was so important to these early colonists was the accessibility to transportation routes. The ability to move product from this region to the larger markets in New York City and along the eastern coast. And the only way you could really do that in the 16 and early 1700s was by waterway. Overland routes were uh, pretty much non-existent and what roads existed uh, were uh, muddy messes after any rainstorm. They were filled with ruts and you couldn't, you couldn't move the volume of goods overland that you could uh, buy water on a, on a sailing vessel. So all of the early settlements take place along the river area. And that's why in East Brunswick, some of those early settlements like the Lawrence Brook section, the Old Bridge Historic District, right, they're all located along of water courses because that's what these early uh, settlers uh, valued very highly. You know, and as Manny mentioned too, um, they're transporting very early on out of this region wood. Right? This whole area was forested and had to be cut down to be turned into agricultural uh, endeavors. So we'll jump ahead to 1850. This is the 1850 Otley Kiley map. So 10 years before East Brunswick was created, yet there are some landmarks on here that we should be rather familiar with. Uh, we can see Old Bridge Turnpike uh, running up here, so Route 18 would be next to it. That wouldn't come until the 1920s. This is Ruse Lane. You can see the Ruse family uh, farm, which was near the Brunswick Square Mall. Um, coming down to Cranberry South River Road. Uh, you have parts of Summer Hill Road here, uh, parts of um, Milltown Road. Um, but notice the, what's noted on this map here, right? You can still see that this was a transitional time in East Brunswick. There's still a lot of wooded area that's being cleared out for agricultural purposes. We'll, I think we'll zero in, let's see here. Yes, so take a look at this, right? So uh, here's the East Brunswick um, Civic Center where our municipal building and the library is. The art center would be somewhere out here. Um, again, here's Roos Lane. And notice that the, f the folks that were living here are denoted on the map. Right? Their houses are denoted and their names are denoted here on the map. Um, and this begins to change. So the next map from 1850, we'll go to about 1876 with this atlas here. And we can see the influx of people that are moving to this area. All right? There's much more um, individuals that are living here, that are farming the land here. And um, East Brunswick begins, uh, begins to grow in population. And on February 28, 1860, as was mentioned, the township is created from a North Brunswick and parts of Monroe Township. When we think of the history of East Brunswick, we often think of farming, and certainly agricultural endeavors were a core part of our history. This here is an aerial photograph that really shows those agricultural endeavors, actually on a later uh, time of transition in the 1950s when much of those agricultural uh, farmland would be turned into housing. But this is uh, located, actually, uh, uh, anybody know where this is? Ethan knows, of course. <laughs> Front, Front of Square Mall, that's the uh, Ostrowski farm. Right. At that, at least that's what it was at that time. Absolutely. Uh, so this is where the Brunswick Square Mall is today. This is Ruse Lane. Right here is the intersection with the um, with Route 18, and uh, this was later the Ostrowski Farm, originally the Rue Farm, and then uh, this is where the Brunswick Square Mall would be. And if we go down a little bit more, the the vocational school would be off to the upper left. In fact, the house that's depicted 
um, on, the, on the top side, they're still standing. It's a little white house in between the mall and the vocational school uh, that's still uh, standing today. And of course, you can see the, the, the early tract housing that was built uh, post-World uh, War II. Um, but clearly, you know, this is what uh, would define East Brunswick as in the, the 1800s, as, it, as many farming and agricultural endeavors took place. So this is a cultivator on the Smith farm, the Smith orchard, where it is today housed, the house is part of the East Brunswick Historical Society. But farming didn't take place in a vacuum, right? They weren't just farmers here farming. It took place because we lived within a region where there was a market economy. You could get that produce, those products, out to a market. And that's how those farmers made their money. And whether they sold them locally in the larger cities like New Brunswick or Perth Amboy, or they loaded them onto vessels or uh, other forms of transportation out to the larger markets in New York City or up and down the eastern seaboard. Um, it was, the, again, the accessibility of those transportation routes that drove the economy here in East Brunswick, this market economy. Early on, it's by water, as I mentioned. This is a painting that was done by James Crawford Tom, a local artist. Um, it's titled Boys Boating on the Lake. It's dated 1887, uh, but it's most likely of the South River, which at one time was a major transportation route, again, for sailing vessels. And to think for one moment that East Brunswick had a maritime history. We had sailing vessels like this coming up the South River and along the Raritan River. With was it wider? Uh, yeah, it's been silted in over the years. Um, but uh, uh, there were vessels, uh, schooners, uh, sloops, that made their way up uh, those water courses, waiting to be filled up with all kinds of produce and then bound for the larger markets. And so you have a class of merchants, you have a class of uh, folks that are working on these vessels, sea captains that are living in the area as well. So it's a real diverse uh, population, not only just folks that are engaged in agricultural, um, but also all the support services for it as well. Uh, this is an artifact that was found in a local home um, that's actually painted, it's a rooster, painted on the canvas sail of one of those sailing vessels that used to come up the South River. Uh, again, an important artifact tying to those, uh, that maritime history. Uh, later, the railroad, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, the railroad was an important uh, transportation uh, route as well for getting goods out of this region. Uh, and then as the, uh, the, the road system improved in the 20th century, uh, there were better ways of, uh, of transporting goods. This is um, a truck loaded, probably a little bit too much, but um, from the, uh, the Jim Maurice farm. I hope they made it uh, from the Jim Maurice farm. Um, but again, showing the, the importance of bringing produce and product to market. And that's what drove the economy uh, during that period. Now, while farming certainly dominated the economy, during the Industrial Revolution, we also were impacted by that here in East Brunswick. Uh, this was a licorice mill that was located where Duhernal Lake is today. Uh, Duhernal Lake was created in the 1930s when the companies of DuPont, Hercules, and National Lead dammed up the, uh, the water course there to create a larger lake and flooded what was left of this licorice mill. Um, this originally opened in the very early 1800s as a gunpowder mill. They made gunpowder here uh, until there was an explosion, right? Because that's what gunpowder does. Um, and it destroyed many of the buildings that were initially there. And then later, it was used as a uh, licorice mill. But the concept of using water power to produce goods uh, was prevalent here in East Brunswick, whether they were making or grinding licorice root, whether they were grinding wheat into flour, or whether they were producing um, lumber from sawmills. There's a number of sections in this town, uh, like Weston's Mill or Davidson's Mill, where there were mills along water courses <laughs> that were powered by, by water uh, to produce those, uh, those products. And then later, as steam engines came into play, uh, steam would power uh, many of the machinery uh, in those, um, uh, those factories. Uh, we have a very early ceramic history here as well. Underneath us, there is a vein of clay that runs from Trenton 
uh, up to the western parts of Middlesex County. It's called the Raritan Clay Deposit. And if you dig down deep enough, you hit this rich vein of clay. And it comes near the surface in places like Cheesequake and Old Bridge and out in South Amboy and Woodbridge. And there were potters that utilized that clay to make this utilitarian stoneware in the very early 1800s. So these were large utilitarian storage crocks that were used to store all kinds of goods. And they were produced here for a time in East Brunswick in the very early 1800s. Uh, this was, this was uh, like the Tupperware of the 1960s. Uh, but if you find one of these, it's worth a little bit more than Tupperware. Uh, these, um, uh, these stoneware crocks go for a lot of money um, at auctions, and um, uh, they're still highly valued uh, today for their, their artistic and sort of folksy uh, designs that are on them. And uh, East Brunswick was well known for some of the production of, uh, of ceramics. Uh, later, many of these, um, uh, during the Industrial Revolution, these sort of home cottage industries would blossom into large manufacturing of ceramic goods. And these are tiles on display at the East Brunswick Museum that were manufactured by the Old Bridge Enamel Brick and Tile Company, a company that was in business between 1890 and 1927, that produced decorative tile for the interiors of homes, um, in, mainly in urban areas like New York City and Brooklyn, as those areas were growing in the foyers or uh, in the, the, the dining rooms surrounding the fireplaces. They had these wonderful decorative um, uh, tiles. And there was a company um, uh, just across the border from East Brunswick, but we'll claim it, um, <laughs> because many of the folks that lived there, or that worked there, lived in East Brunswick, um, uh, produced these wonderful decorative tiles. In East Brunswick, we had the Boston and Philadelphia Brick Face Company. This was located off of Stratford Road along the Raritan River Railroad. Uh, there is a, um, a housing development that was built probably in the last 15 years there, um, kind of near where uh, ri um, Riders Lane crosses over the, uh, the railroad tracks um, and the New Jersey Turnpike. Uh, off to the one side is where there was a company that produced decorative face brick for the front facades of buildings. But again, tapping in to what was this natural resource below everyone's feet. So transportation routes. So this is looking at one of, we talked about water courses as improved, roadways were constructed. Uh, the early roadways during the colonial period were rather rather horrendous. They often just sort of wound their way through whatever obstacle they were trying to get around or whatever water course they were meandering along with. In the early 1800s, we adopt an English system of turnpikes. And the Old Bridge Turnpike, as the name suggests, was a turnpike. You had to pay a toll to travel on the Old Bridge Turnpike. So the, you know, the New Jersey Turnpike isn't the first toll road uh, through East Brunswick. Uh, Way back in the early 1800s, the Old Bridge Turnpike um, was one of these early toll roads, and the money was meant to reinvest back into uh, the road to maintain it. And if you travel on the Old Bridge Turnpike today, there are some characteristics you know, that are 200 years old that you can still find on that road, right? If you're on it, there's portions of it that are really straight, right? It doesn't curve, it's not meandering here and there. It's a straight road that's got a nice straight clearing and a straight run, and all of that was not by accident, right? That was purposely built that way. Um, this is looking at the turnpike starting location in the Old Bridge Historic District, looking up the hill. Chestnut Hill Cemetery would be on the right-hand side, um, and uh, you go further up, you pass Chittick School, and so forth. Um, Route 1 originally also was a turnpike. It was laid out in 1804. It was called the Straight Turnpike. And if, ever, if you're ever on Route 1 heading south towards Trenton, you'll, you'll know why. You can see for miles in some places where it just, you know, it has a straight run. And all, again, all of that was not by accident. They were purposely designed that way because of, uh, they, were, they were improving the road systems here. Um, there were a number of hotels that sprung up along these, these roadways to support travelers. Uh, and there are, um, uh, there are a number of them here in East Brunswick. This is the Central Hotel. 
which was uh, owned by John uh, Hall. It was located at the corner of Ruse Lane and Cranberry Road. I believe there's a BP gas station there today. Uh, and that's the, uh, the, the hotel that was there, again, to accommodate the travelers who were coming by horse and wagon um, on these road systems. And he needed a place to stop, get something to eat or drink, or to spend the night. And then Route 18. Um, <laughs> So this is where Route 18, uh, where Edgeboro Road merges with Route 18 heading north. Uh, so the railroad tracks in the front there were from the old Raritan River Railroad, the service branch that crossed over Route 18. And uh, so this is heading uh, north, just past where Edgeboro Land, um, Edgeboro Road, and uh, Old Bridge Turnpike merge onto uh, onto Route 18, and uh, Sunoco gas station there. Um, uh, Route 18, there may be folks here who remember at one time was a three-lane highway. You had one northbound, one southbound, and you had a middle lane, which was the passing lane, which I understand was affectionately called the chicken lane or the suicide lane, <laughs> figuring out who was going to try and pass who without coming head on to the person coming in the other direction. And then trains. The first railroad in the state of New Jersey went through parts of East Brunswick. So down by Main Street, by the historic district, by Bowman Row School, by the President Street, that stretch of railroad line that runs there is the first railroad in the state of New Jersey. It was the Camden and Amboy Railroad. There was a station stop in Old Bridge, as seen here. And the first uh, steam engine to run on it was a steam engine that was brought over from England. It was called the John Bull. Uh, it ran from Camden to South Amboy or the other way, depending where you're going. And the original cars were pulled by horses before they had a steam train. They had two horses on each side of the track that would pull these cars along, two cars. And the legend goes that when they came to the bridge at South River, the horses wouldn't walk across the train trestle. So they would unhook the, the, the horses, they swam them across the river, and the male passengers got out and pushed the cars uh, over the bridge. <laughs> Sounds like traveling on New Jersey Transit, maybe something. <laughs> so this is the first uh, steam engine to operate on the line that John Bull came over from England. Um, one of the first steam engines in the, uh, in the uh, United States, the first one here in New Jersey. Uh, and it still survives today. You can visit it. It's on display at the Smithsonian Institute in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, education. Um, certainly, East Brunswick has a long tradition of um, education here uh, in the township. Uh, this is a school teacher that was painted about 1885. He looks rather menacing with that ruler uh, in his hand. Um, but. Uh, the earliest schools in the township were one-room schoolhouses. There's one that's still standing uh, in the historic district that was built in the 1840s. Uh, and these were the first attempt at a public education system were these one-room structures, where both boys and girls were crammed into the space um, with uh, no standard books or textbooks. And um, it must have been rather trying for teachers like this to, to teach students at all different age levels. Um, and many of which would be pulled out when it was work was needed back on the farm. But it was the first attempt at providing a meaningful education uh, to students, a public education system. And this here is an image of um, the schoolhouse that's still standing in the historic district. Uh, this was painted, this painting was done by James Crawford Tom uh, in the 1890s, and it shows children coming out of school on a winter's day. And what do children do when they come out and there's snow all over the ground? They're about to have a snowball fight, right? These boys here are arming themselves. There's another group out in the middle of the street. These unlucky ones are getting to get caught in the middle of all of it. Uh, but it's just such a wonderful painting that captures um, a snippet of life uh, for students here in East Brunswick in the late 1800s. Do you remember that painting used to hang? My, is it, go ahead. Uh, the Leonard Aldridge painting? Is it the Waldorf story? Yes. Okay. So uh, Ethan's bringing up, and he's absolutely right, that that painting used to hang in the old Waldorf Astoria in uh, New York City, which was where the Empire State Building would, was built later on that site. Um, and, and it hangs today in the East Brunswick Museum, so you can go and, uh, and visit it. Uh, this here is uh, Crandall School, which was built in 1908. This is the second generation of schoolhouses that were constructed in East Brunswick, um, multiple grades. Right, big windows to let lots of natural light in. 
And this building still stands also uh, in the historic district. Nice interior shot. This is Wade School in 1923. Uh, this schoolhouse is no longer standing. It was located along Milltown Road. And finally, we get to, I think, the, the, the most important part, really, are the people. There's such diversity in our community today. And that is a story that is as old as the township itself. The folks that lived here historically came from many different places. They were English, they were Dutch, they were French Huguenots, they were Germans, they were Palatines. They were uh, African Americans, both enslaved and free blacks that lived uh, in this area. They were Native Americans. And they all lived uh, in this region, which made it extremely culturally diverse, and that is a story that continues uh, to this day. These are, uh, this is a string band uh, in Old Bridge. I would have loved to have heard what they were playing. Um, I'll just run through putting faces behind our history here. Here's Dallenbacks in the 1950s. <laughs> This is James Crawford Tom, who talked about the artist for a time that lived here in East Brunswick. Um, he was a well-known artist at, uh, during the time he studied abroad in France and England, later went up to the Hudson River Valley, and then lived in East Brunswick uh, in the 1880s. Eventually, he moved to the Atlantic Highlands. He died there in the 1890s. He was buried back in East Brunswick at Chestnut Hill Cemetery. Uh, and the East Brunswick Museum has a great collection of his, um, of his paintings. Um, this is uh, Bill Kramer and his wife Martha Kramer um, on their wedding day in 1929. Any of you remember them? Bill Kramer, this is them later in life. Uh, Bill Kramer was a local historian, and we owe a lot to the work that Bill did. Um, he moved for, uh, to East Brunswick in 1910 uh, as a young boy and, uh, and lived most of his life here and uh, loved the history of the area. He lived in that one-room schoolhouse in the historic district and was a local historian uh, for many years. Uh, here's the East, East Brunswick's finest uh, in the 1950s. Uh, the gentleman uh, on the end here, not in the uniform on that side, is Charlie Sullivan, uh, who also uh, was involved with East Brunswick politics for many years. Mayor. Mayor as well, yes, thank you. Um, this is um, uh, Helen Chittick. She was the, uh, the wife of Murray Chittick, uh, who Chittick School was named after. Murray Chittick was um, a teacher, a principal at Crandall School, and later the superintendent of schools here in East Brunswick. Um, uh, the family, Father George, lived on Main Street. The house that they lived in is still standing today in the Old Bridge Historic District. Uh, through this, and I love this one, a clean town is a healthy town. It's a public works garage uh, in the 1950s. This is a town council meeting from the 1940s. Uh, the desk that they're sitting at, not this one here, the one in the center is in the collection of the East Brunswick Museum. Uh, in the center is Charles Sullivan, just next to him is Vernon Appleby. This here is um, Grace Hour playing tennis on uh, her farm, uh, Cranberry Road, the farmhouse is still standing. And this here is uh, Grace in later years. Of course, Grace was so instrumental for many of the institutions here in East Brunswick. Um, the list is rather lengthy of her involvement. Uh, notably, she was with the East Brunswick Museum, the Historical Society, and also uh, heavily involved with the Middlesex County Fair since its inception in 1938. This is William Augustus Rogers, who uh, was born in East Brunswick. The house he was born in still stands today. He was born in uh, 18. Uh, 41. Um, he fought in the Civil War. He was killed at the Battle of Chancellorville in 1863. And we have a number of East Brunswick residents that both served and who lost their lives during the Civil War. Uh, those that survived the war, many of them found their way back to some of these battlefield sites. Uh, this is, these are members of the Appleby family out in Gettysburg in the 1890s, uh, taking a tour of the battleground there that they had fought at decades earlier. In the 1950s, in fact, some of the greatest change that this township would see took place during that time period. Um, the population in East Brunswick in 1950 was about 5,700 people. In 1960, in 10 years, that population would go to roughly 20,000. 
Right? It's about a 250% increase in population in those 10 years. That is the biggest um, change as far as population is concerned that took place uh, in the town. And it's mainly due to a number of factors. One is an improved transportation system, the roadways, the, the 1950s also, the car culture, uh, you know, the rise of the automobile, and I love this advertisement. It's two Ford, it's a two Ford garage, right? And you've got the town and country car in the back, right? You can pack the kids in there, get a picnic, go out into the country. Um, you can see the type of housing that they're living in. Right, it's uh, part of those tract homes that are built after the uh, Second World War, which really would come to define our town. And much of that is, uh, and this here, this is um, looking up, this is, uh, I believe, 1948, 49 this was taken. This was looking up Riders Lane to the intersection of Milltown Road. So on the right, on the, across the street would be where Home Depot is today. And these are the houses that were on the other side, looking up the hill towards the intersection where Milltown Road is. This is the construction of the New Jersey Turnpike. Uh, the New Jersey Turnpike Authority was created in 1949. Um, this is the construction of Interchange 9, where the administration building is. And this was taken in 1957. And that building's still standing, the Turnpike Administration Building. But this is one of the reasons why East Brunswick grew to be what it is. You know, it's the opening of the Turnpike. It's the opening of the Garden State Parkway. It's the rise of the automobile. It's people looking to get out of the urban areas. Right? And that's what attracted people to this region in the 1950s. This real I, 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 idealistic way, uh, uh, lifestyle. I love this image, right? If everybody was like that, there's mom in her evening dress serving Coca-Cola. <laughs> there with a with pipe. Uh, and there's their home entertainment system. They got a radio, a phonograph, and a TV all in one. It's the iPad of the 1950s. Right? <laughs> also, it's a time here we shouldn't forget for all the uh, what advertisements sh showed the prosperity. It was also a time period that was um, uh, the Cold War era, right? Where there were Nike missile bases in Middlesex County, one in South Plainfield, another in Oldbridge Township, um, that were meant to uh, create this circle of defense around New York City and protect it from Russian bombers. Uh, there's Bert the Turtle with the duck and cover, um, you know, school children from that period ducking under their desks uh, to protect them from you know, an atomic blast. How those desks would do that, I'm not sure, but nonetheless, that was the message. And finally, many of the photographs and artifacts in this pr uh, presentation are housed at the East Brunswick Museum. Uh, the building was formerly a Methodist church built in 1862, and today serves as the, uh, as the East Brunswick Museum, where there's a wonderful collection of historic artifacts. Uh, as well as the East Brunswick Historical Society and the projects and programs that they do. These two great institutions help preserve the history of our township. And we come uh, full circle back to uh, this Ill image of Helen Stanovich. Uh, Helen married Joseph Archeshevsky. She moved to South River in the 1950s. They raised a family of four girls, uh, three of which still live in central New Jersey. One is in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. And um, although Helen's passed away, her stories about her childhood home and the farm that she grew up in along a Ruse Lane are part of the collection uh, that can be found at the East Brunswick Museum. And um, this is um, uh, uh, why these two institutions, the Historical Society and the museum are important because they help preserve uh, the story of our township. And it's a story that's, um, that's worth preserving. Thank you very much. That is really a great uh, program that Mark just uh, put us through. And, you know, it's really difficult to put a program like that together because uh, to cover this amount of time when you're going back to the uh, 1800s, I mean, there's a million photos that we could use to do this. And I think Mark selected a great uh, range of uh, pictures to show what, what it was like living here over the years and how things have changed. And speaking of change, I'm now going to introduce our mayor, uh, Dr. Brad Cohn, who's going to talk about which direction East Brunswick is going in 
from this time forward. Mayor Collins. Thanks, Howard, um, and Manny, and Mark for doing such a great job taking us from our very, very, very proud beginnings to where we are right now. And it is a rich history. And um, every single, I think typically, this time of year I get third graders that come up to the municipal building and part of their field trip is to learn a little bit about the history of the township. And they do that by coming up, they speak and have an opportunity to meet with me as the mayor. They get a tour of the police department. They love the whole idea of taking a look at the jails. I don't know what they have about <laughs> the jails. And, uh, and then they get an opportunity to sit into the courtroom and learn about how the judicial system works by watching our own municipal court system work. So it's a little bit of a, of a dabble into um, municipal government and civics, which is something that I think we're desperately missing in education today. We, uh, at a point now where everybody could do things online, but the one thing that you can't do is civics, that you just have to do. Um, so it gives me an opportunity to really reach out to that group. And the one thing that I ask them to do when they come into the room uh, is to put their thinking caps on and think that if they were back in 1860, what would East Brunswick look like? And I remind them that cars weren't invented till 1909, so please don't tell me about Route 18 and the turnpike and cars and all of that stuff. If you were literally walking around East Brunswick, what would it look like? Um, and eventually they get with little hints about where the garden state, that um, they get to the fact that most of this area at that time was farmland. And, uh, and I also ask them and teach them the fact that uh, in those days, East Brunswick paid a very, very important role, as you now know, in the development and the building of New York City from its building blocks of lumber and bricks and clay. Um, and that I asked them to think, how did they get that stuff from East Brunswick to New York City if we didn't have cars at that point? And eventually they get the train part, but they absolutely blow it on the, on the, the boats. Uh, because nobody really today really thinks that this area actually used to be such a corridor that was important for its, its routes that you've learned today are all based on the, the water routes. But as I look at East Brunswick and I look at our history as you just learned today, there's a couple of things that stand out. Number one, every time somebody new came here, the people that were here didn't want them. <laughs> that hasn't changed. <laughs> but we do have some core features that haven't changed over time that need to be factored into the way we vision what the future of East Brunswick is going to look like. First and foremost, we've been blessed by our location. Uh, we literally are the center of New Jersey. That's why I'm capitalizing on that from a marketing point of view, because we really are. Um, the trade routes were here in terms of water routes. Uh, we sit right between New York and, and Philadelphia. We sit right between uh, Rutgers and the shore. We have now, of course, almost every major highway that crosses here. It is an asset that we absolutely must take advantage of. We are blessed with that. We must capitalize on that if we are to think where we're going to go in, in the future. We have also, as you learned here, have always placed an emphasis on education back to 1860 to now, that has always been a core feature of East Brunswick. People, to this day, if you talk to realtors, still say that the number one reason that they moved to East Brunswick was because of the education uh, opportunities that are provided over here. And that hasn't changed, and, and I'm hoping that that will never change. It is the thing that keeps your property values where they are. So for everybody who keeps whining to me, and I saw there was a slide, about back in the 1860s how people were complaining about taxes, that has not changed. Um, we have place a value on the things that we provide here. One of them, at the foremost, is our educational system. I could absolutely turn um, taxes backwards for you. We get rid of the good educational system we have. People don't want to move here. Your houses are worth less. We pay a percent of taxes based on the value of your houses, and voila, you now have lower taxes. That's not what you want me to do, and that's not what I want to do. We need to continue to draw the same type of people to this town for the same reasons that people have been drawn here for decades. 
And then the third big thing that we have is safety. Uh, we place a great emphasis on our East Brunswick Police Department to keep us a quiet and safe community, considering the things that you only should know, well, I don't want you to know, that, that, that could plague this community based on our location being right off of the turnpike. If anybody wanted to commit a crime and get out of the area quickly, that's what they, East Brunswick would be the place to do it. It's an affluent community and you can get the heck out of here quickly. But you don't hear about it because we have an unbelievable police department and we pay for that. But that is a core strength to our community. So all of those things become core features that, that we don't ever really want to lose and in fact we want to capitalize on. Thinking to the future, we still have to recognize what trends are occurring around us so that as we plan that future, it takes into account things that are painfully obvious and in front of our eyes. Number one, the changing nature of retail. What does anybody think is the number one reason that retail has changed, why all these big box stores have closed? <coughs> That's what everybody thinks. Everybody thinks that the reason that, it, that the big box stores have closed is because of e-commerce, Amazon, and all of the internet trading. But the reality is that based on uh, University of Chicago Business School studies that just came out, that is absolutely not the reason. To this day, um, at this particular time, only 11% of all retail sales is done on the internet. Only 11%. Now, that poses an opportunity in the future, which is why developers will absolutely not develop anything that involves too much retail, because that leaves a huge uh, uh, the area of growth to occur in e-commerce that hasn't even been uh, done yet. The main reasons that a lot of the big box stores have closed is because people have moved to other big box stores. So instead of shopping in Kmart or shopping in Sears, people are now shopping in Costco and uh, Sam's Club and BJ's. The second reason that we don't really see a lot of these stores are closed is because of the shrinking buying capacity of middle class Americans. As the income disparity has grown, it has actually caused middle class people to have less disposable income and so they're not spending the way they did proportionally um, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And the last reason why you're not seeing, uh, why a lot of those stores have, have closed is because of the way in which we shop. Most Americans are buying services and not things. So instead of shopping for things, we're buying entertainment, we're buying healthcare services, we're buying drugs, we're buying, not illegal drugs. <laughs> so we're spending a lot more on, on things that don't need to be housed in big box stores. But the reason that developers who have all come to this community wanting to do development will not replace the commercial space that you have right now is because there is no demand for it. And if they see that only 11% of retail sales are being done on the internet, that leaves an awful lot of growth. And they're not going to build something that cannot and will not be rented out. So we need to rethink what we're going to put in those retail spaces since no one will rebuild that. The other factor, second factor that we need to think as we prepare for the future is the fact that the largest segment of, of, of Americans in terms of groupings based on ages are millennials. Now, millennials have very, very specific um, issues in and in, of themselves as a group. Firstly, we all thought that they all want to move to the city. They all want to live in Hoboken. They all want to live in Jersey City. They all want to live in Manhattan. And that was true for a while while they were younger, out of college. They wanted to do whatever, be in the city. I get the, the lore to it. It wasn't like it was for me where it was such a crime-ridden area. It would never have been anything I would have considered as a baby boomer to go to the city. We flocked away from the city. They flocked to it. But now that they're at the age where they're having children, and where they're looking to settle down, they're not putting their kids in the Jersey City School District. Sorry, they're not doing that. And so they are actually starting to look and think about the same things that we thought about when we moved 
to, to East Brunswick. And that is they want safe communities, they want easy accessibility back and forth to the city, even though they may not be traveling there every day. And they want good educational systems as they start to put their kids in school. Their needs are not any different. You also have to think that they also have a lot more debt compared to baby boomers who were moving in at that time. A lot more debt. So it will dictate what they buy. They may not want to buy right away. They may not be able to afford to buy right away. Many of them will rent. And when they do buy, they're not going to buy the big McMansions that people have um, flocked to as baby boomers because they simply can't afford it. And even if they could, they're not paying $30,000 a year in property taxes for that piece of property. They will take something smaller. They also have not the salaries that in, uh, accounting for the increase in um, uh, cost of living, they're not making what we made before. So they don't have the disposable income that we did, or I'm saying we, like baby boomers and Generation Z, they don't have that disposable income. And the last thing is that the group that's moving here is far more diverse than what moved here before. If interesting fact that I just got from the uh, Middlesex County Chamber of Commerce, that 33% uh, of all people that live in Middlesex County are immigrants. 33%. Does anybody know the top, the, the, well, I'll give you the top five immigrant, immigrant groups that have moved here, but who's number one? Indian by far, by far. The surprising part to me was number two, because I just, kept thinking about East Brunswick, but you got to think about Middlesex County. Who's number two? Asian. Asian. Russian. Asian. Dominican Republic. Oh. Number three was Mexican. Number four was Chinese. And number five was the Coptic community, which I find very interesting. That, that the, so the reality is that the people moving here are just diverse has always been, diversity has always been a key factor of people who've lived here and have core strength, as Mark told us. That's not changing, but it's just different than what we're used to. And then the last big thing that I need to think about it, we need to think about as a community when we think about the future, is the baby boomers. Like, let's not forget them. Because the reality is that of the $122 trillion of income that sits in savings accounts. There's about $122 trillion of income that sits in, in savings accounts um, based on the data from the Federal Reserve second quarter of 2019, the most recent for which we have that type of information. Of all of the accumulated wealth in this country, 50% of it sits within the baby boomer population. 50%, not millennials, that's only 5.9%. So if you really think about it, most baby boomers at this point in time have a lot, obviously, the lion's share of, of disposable income. They probably either don't have a mortgage left or very little left. Their biggest expenses, which are generally college expenses, are behind them. They have way more disposable income than any group in all of the of all of the different groups that are listed. So don't ever forget the power of baby boomers. So all of that has to go into the picture of where we're going to go at in the future. What are the industries that are coming here? You heard that in the beginning of, uh, uh, of our earliest roots we were a farming industry. But we were very good at being able to adapt to a changing uh, environment as the Industrial Revolution came into place, we became more of a manufacturing township. Uh, and that changed again. We became more of a technology. And, uh, and, and with the opening of the turnpike in 1950, it allowed more people to live here and commute back and forth to the city. So where are we going from here? Well, a couple of the industries that stand out as obvious since we are moving more and more to a, uh, a e-commerce type of economy, procurement centers are clearly 
an important feature because we need to be able to move product to back and forth very quickly. And the areas and the towns that have the most opportunity in the procurement world are going to be those that are closest to the main transportation centers, which is why you saw an Amazon open up in Robbinsville and an Amazon open up in Edison and, and all of the, and we're just exactly located right off of the turnpike at exit nine. Procurement becomes a big industry of the future. Technology will still be an industry and a um, feature that we will be able to um, take advantage of because of our unique um, access to a university um, and, a, and a, community, a community that's been very much um, geared towards uh, high educational aspirations from those that have moved here. We have a very large medical community here. We have a university community here. We have financial people who live here. And the other industry, of course, is, is IT. So all of that has to be thought of as we look at the future. So at this particular point in time, our number one objective is to take a look at buildings and structures that are, from our standpoint, obsolete. Uh, and so the clear first target was the Route 18 properties that sit where the Lomans and the Gap and the Wiz are. It's 44 contiguous areas of property that are almost entirely empty except for a couple of small stores that have been lucky enough to stay, stay and survive. From the standpoint of the township's point of view and taxes, which I know is important to everybody, those properties right now pay the town about $1.5 million in taxes per year. But those taxes are based on occupancy on the percentage of property that's rented. They're rent rolls, essentially. It's different than your home. Frankly, I could care less in if you live in your home or not. If you own it, you pay taxes on it. Um, but that's not the same for retail establishments that pay based on a, their percentage um, and their rent rolls. So we all know that at one point in time, that was a great area for commerce. There was lines of people. You could never find a spot in the, the Lowman's parking lot. That has clearly changed. But they're being taxed at the rate they were paying when they were 100% occupied. And we all know that that's not the case. So every single one of those properties all, all have tax appeals going back to 2013. And they will win every one of them because we all know that they're not 100% occupied. So we will owe them money back, and their new tax rate's gonna be lower. So they will be paying to the town less money, we'll owe them money back. If our expenses stay the same, which is rare that every year, your expenses you expect to go up a little bit each year, but even if it stayed the same, we will all be paying more money to keep those properties in the condition that they're in, and that's just not sustainable. And that goes for all of the areas where you have blighted properties, because any one of them that the Wonder Bread Factory, another one, back to 2012, they have tax appeals going and they will win them all. So you can't leave them the way they are. Our clear um, goal in moving forward is to try to create something that an investor would want to invest in. I told you right now, they're not building more commercial. There's about 400,000 square feet of commercial space just in the Lomans and Gap complex alone. The Plans for the Future calls for about a quarter of that, about 97,000 square feet of retail space. And it was like pulling um, on, the, uh, on the neck of the developer to even build that much. They're not sure that that's gonna sell. So those properties will be uh, mostly mixed use where you have some development that's geared towards commercial, some development that's geared towards residential. There's going to be a hotel a third bus station, because again, we really do need to be and continue to be a transportation hub. And there's overwhelmingly likely to be some space set aside for community use, which we can decide as a community. Um, the bus station becomes critical because we have about a three year wait for the two bus stations that we own right now. So anybody putting their name on the list might as well really not expect to get a spot anytime in, in the future because it's just so unlikely. People just don't give up a spot for the small amount that they're paying. So the future um, is going to have to be geared towards um, continuing 
the things that we are already um, a good, good, good at and being the transportation center that we are. And we also have to keep in mind that the future of transportation is going to change. Cars may become autonomous. Um, we want to try to meet, create a community that has um, a commitment to sustainability. So the area that we're talking about will be more of a downtown-ish transit-oriented area where you could walk and live and work and play. Because while it is the type of thing that millennials are, in are interested, that's why they're moving and looking at New York and Hoboken and Jersey City. But what we've learned from studies of marketing, that what works for millennials ends up trickling down and working for the rest of us. That there's no way that as baby boomers who have far more money, that we're not going to go out and eat in the restaurants and shop in the stores and utilize the public transportation. And those things that the millennials want are no different than the things that the rest of us want. And marketers know that also. That's why they poll millennials all the time, because what they like, we eventually um, pick up. I've got Facebook, you know, millennials started that. They're not even on it anymore. They're on, uh, what, it's, uh, Snapchat and Instagram. All of us baby boomers are on Facebook. Uber, I never thought I would do an Uber. They started it, I'm now doing it. So what they have started seems to be um, the type of market trends that marketers follow because it's not because they care only about millennials. They realize that they are the market leaders and what they like eventually everybody else likes as well. So these are the type of things that we're thinking about as we look forward um, in the future for East Brunswick. Who do we intend to attract here by what we're doing? No different than what attracted people to move here before. We sit right between a university. Um, we have the three biggest industries I've spoken about already. The areas that we're talking about developing will cater to um, medical. It's going to cater to the arts. And it's going to cater to technology, as a lot of the space is going to be available for shared working space, as um, people in the future are not going to be going to the city every day. We already see that many people work from home, work from um, shared office space, uh, and maybe go into the city once or twice a week. We have to be prepared for those changes and provide those type of options for people so that that becomes another reason to move here. And they will still be looking at the schools and they will still be looking at our safety. They will still be looking at the ease of access. And I think that the future for East Brunswick is as bright as it was before, but it's in our hands. We can make it what we want, but we have to clearly have a firm grip on where we came from, an idea of what people want in the future, and make sure that we do what we have always done and that is to adapt to a changing time so that the people that live here could be as proud of the community and their history 20, 30, 40 years from now when they're doing these type of talks and they're talking about what we did now. So I thank you for your time. And I want to thank everyone for putting this program together. I think it's incredibly helpful. Sure. Anybody have any questions for this, any of the speakers or the mayor. Now is your chance. <laughs> yes. One thing that the mayor didn't mention, you're talking about education and building all these new um, residences. Are there any intents to build another school? Any intent to build what? Another school? The question is, are any schools, are any schools going to be built? So the question was about schools. First, um, initially, if you look at school enrollment data, which I was showing to people as little as a year ago, the trend line for enrollment in the East Brunswick schools had dropped from a peak of about 8,000 or 8,200 students. And as of about two years ago, our enrollment hovered around 8,000. So the reality was that we didn't really feel there was a need to even think about schools because there was such a large uh, gap and unused space that we didn't really feel that the number coming in would, would generate the need for any type of change in schools. The reality is that in the last year and a half, there's been a significant change in the township for reasons that I cannot tell you, other than maybe millennials are finally starting to have their children, and maybe millennials are thinking of moving to East Brunswick because of our schools. The enrollment in the last year and a half has jumped about 500 which is a big change in a short period of time. That change is primarily in second, third, and fourth grade. 
So the school system, and again, I'm not responsible for the Board of Ed and their decisions. I was on the Board of Ed, but not now. Um, so they need to figure out, is that a trend? You know, that's just a year. Is it a point in time, like a boa that just ate its dinner and we need to see if it's going to just work its way through? Um, or is this really a trend that's going to continue? If it's really a trend that's going to continue, then we are going to need to have to think about schools before we did one drop of redevelopment work because we already have that problem. The other thing to think about, and it's a plus minus in my head, um, we have a great reputation for our special needs programs. About a third of those 500 kids all have special needs, some sort of IEP. So it's good in the sense that we've done a great job um, being uh, taking care of special needs programs, but they are the most expensive students to educate. So these are all issues that we're going to have to face. I don't think the Board of Ed is ready to come out with a recommendation. If you've been watching the news, um, at Warren's Dorford at Irwin, they're putting up trailers. Why would they be doing that? Because they clearly don't have enough room to house the students that are there. If that's a trend that's going to continue year after year for the next couple of years, we will already, without doing one drop of redevelopment, have to face the question of what to do with housing those kids. So I can't answer the question because we don't have enough data points to know yet whether that really is a trend or just a one-time increase. Um, Edgeboro Landfill, what is, what is that, the life of it? Is well, Edgeboro Landfill is, is, is has to close when it's at 240 feet, it's at 180 now. Um, we do get community um, benefits to the tune of about $4 million a year for hosting the, uh, the landfill in the township. So if we're good at recycling and we're good at trying to be good stewards of the earth, we'll be able to maintain that for a longer period of time because it won't fill as fast. But if, um, if, you're, if your goal is to end the Edgeboro landfill altogether, then start throwing away like crazy because you'll get the 240 feet faster. There have been places where they've covered landfills and they turn it into parks. Is there any plans whatsoever? Eventually, that? once you reach the, the number that they, they turn, they actually cap it. Um, How many years is I just told you, it depends on the rate at which we get to 240. Once we're at the number, then we're done. So if we are throwing out garbage so faster, right now they're estimating somewhere around I think the last time I checked, 130. But I'm not sure, that's if we kept going at the same rate. Right now there's a big effort trying to recycle and to be more sustainable, so we're hoping that we could extend that longer. For those of you that uh, think it from the opposite point of view, you want it to close faster, the more you throw out, the faster it'll get up to uh, the, the cap. The other part is we used to have a marina in East Brunswick right here on the Raritan River. Right. Are there any plans to There's no that? plans because the cost of dredging it would be astronomical. One of the concerns to complain to get quite often, and I guess I put myself in the same class, is the condition of our local roads. Right. Uh, it's not pleasant driving. I, I've heard people say the local road condition, they're under the control of the repair shop. A repair shop? An automobile repair shop. <laughs> I don't know about that. We have, we have about 180 miles of road in East Brunswick as a township is responsible for. The rest are county roads and then the state road, which is Route 18, and all of the overpasses and turnarounds. It's all um, the, the state. Uh, it's about $400,000 for every mile of road that you pave. In New Jersey, that, is, uh, that makes us the number one state for the cost of repaving roads. I can't control that as the mayor of East Brunswick. Maybe if you make me governor or something, I can do that. But right now, I have no control over that. So if you want to spend all your tax dollars on repairing roads, I could basically shut down the entire township for the entire year, probably two or three years, and we can get all the roads done. So the only way that you really could practically do that is to have a budget for roads, which we um, each year have been trying to increase since the recession. We really had not really enough money to pay during the recession, so you probably saw that a lot of that was left not attended to. And we're trying to make up for that. We rank all the roads, and we try to get to them in, a, in as fair a fashion as possible. If uh, I do one section of town, then everybody that lives in the other section of town is going to complain that I didn't do theirs. If you live on a street that's a cul-de-sac with two houses, sorry, that's not going to be ranked as high as a main arterial road. 
So there is, a, and then I hate to publish the list of roads because like with your home, depending on the winter that we go through, um, things could change. The, the number 11 could now move up to number one because they just took a beating um, during the winter. So I really don't like to publish the list because all it does is get the people that were one road away from being covered uh, to complain why theirs isn't um, being attended to first. But this year we're doubling the amount of money for roads. We're putting about four million uh, into roads this year, which doing the math only gets us about 10 miles a road of the 180. So we are making the effort. If there's problems that you have, um, I can't, none of us have eyes all over the town, so we ask that you call the Department of Public Works. They'll do what they can to fix potholes and small repairs, um, but when those roads become untenable any longer, they go onto the list for repaving. And we don't have a department that does repaving. We have to go out to bid for that. And the earlier in the year we go out for bid, the better prices we get. So we end up doing that in the fall, um, even though we're not doing the work till the spring. I love that question because number one it depends on what you define as senior housing. The question was, what, are we have any plans for senior housing? Um, I hate to say this, but even though I know that we have a demand in town for over 55 type communities, I cannot find a developer who will come in here and do that. They just don't see that as a market, and unless the town wants to be the developer, I can't ask somebody to develop something that they just don't want to do. In fact, if the um, community that most of you might be familiar with that's being built by Main Street, um, right by the uh, historical section and the um, presidential streets, that was originally, years and years ago, um, bought by somebody who had an age restriction placed on that community, which actually I think would have, not that I'm happy that they were building it at all there, but, but that age restriction wasn't unreasonable considering that you can't widen the road there, and there's already a school there. So the increased traffic, I personally think, is dangerous uh, for that section of town that can't handle it. Um, but he went to court and fought the town 15 years, that's two mayors ago, um, actually three if you count Kevin's interim mayorship for a year, and one, and the, and the age restriction was removed. So it's, you just, none of the developers want to do that. He actually came to me about two years ago, the developer, and wanted to know if I would be willing to give him a tax reduction program in return for building more affordable units. And I told him the only way that I would even entertain that thought is if he went back to the age restriction because that we could actually use. And he got up and walked out. <coughs> so I can't ask, I mean, we've asked many, many times. The Hidden Oaks project that was supposed to be built, which we keep trying to stop, by uh, the corner of University and Hearts, that was originally also an age-restricted area. Frankly, it was originally uh, industrial, and frankly, it should stay that way. Um, there has to be a reason Frank Root didn't build on that land, because he built on everything else. So if he didn't want it, you know, how is it that somebody else wanted it? But. Um, then they got it changed to an age-restricted um, residential community, and then they got themselves attached to the affordable housing um, settlement that was done in 2016, and they asked that the age restriction be removed. And the courts were so happy to be able to get affordable housing in town that they allowed that age restriction to be removed. So you can't, I'm just giving you example after example, even though I think that there would be a big market for people who are over 55 that would want to stay here and have that type of community here. I can't find a developer to build it. <laughs> Elaine. Might there be a possibility statewide for a mandate that just as each developer years ago in each community had to build X number of affordable housing units to have to build X number of senior. Yeah, the units. question was if you have affordable units, can you ask them that they set aside a percentage for affordable? We already do that. And we, in no, our no, 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 no. To set aside, I know we do it for affordable, 
to set aside for senior housing? Well, the, the problem with asking them to set aside, senior, you're, you're basically mandating that nobody, something that nobody wants to build. Even if it were just a percentage by law? Yeah, they, the developers don't want to build that. They don't want restrictions on the units that they're building. So why do you think that the uh, state, which requires by the uh, moral doctrine, um, they require that a certain percentage of any new building set aside for affordables? I can promise you that developers don't want to build the affordables. They're under market. So, and since the state aren't, they're not developers and the township's not developers, if you want to get affordable units in your town, you're going to have to work with the developers and you can't force them to build something that doesn't make money. So the only way that the deal works with them is if a percentage is set aside for affordable and that they're allowed to make money on the remaining percent. So it, you, you can't mandate that somebody build something that they lose money on. One thing I, I'll say is the mayor is trying his best <laughs> to do our town well. And, and I, I think the plans uh, are, are, are really looking pretty good. I have town halls coming up that are yes. on the website. Everybody's welcome to yeah. come to that. Yeah, and, and you should attend because then you'll have a chance to really get into more depth. Uh, we do uh, want to thank everyone for coming. I hope you learned a little bit about East Project. There are probably some of you here who know a lot about it already. So I hope you enjoyed. Please enjoy the instruction.